The exchange. There is a long and illustrious tradition of low-life trailer trash in my wife's family. Her father has the IQ of a lemur and has never worked a day in his life. He does drink, though, and on sometimes that gets him to touch up Jill's mother. Jill's mother abandoned her two children, neither of which her purported husband was the father. She did, however, maintain a reliable employment at a strip club. She expressed her liking for the atmosphere. She seemed to be a pretty woman until alcoholism and drug abuse took hold of her. On the other hand, she now gives new meaning to the phrase ridden hard and put up wet. When Jill's sister Willie arrived, she was six years old. Wilhelmina is Willie's true name. It's an ode to a Dutch man who died nine months before she was born. God knows where Jill's mother was all the time. Thus, from the day Willie was born, Jill took care of her, even though she was still a little child herself. Jill raised her younger sister with love and attention as they grew older. So the relationships were not limited to sisterhood. Willie felt like a child of Jill. She was shielded from her drunken tirades by Jill. And Jill worked hard to save up enough cash to feed them when their parents disappeared. Jill's feeling of selflessness was therefore ingrained from birth. That's something you should bear in mind while you read this. The two sisters' dissimilarities and look are the other crucial factor. Jill's potential hit-and-run victim had to be a Swede. She has the seductive mouth, long, thin Swedish nose, thick blonde hair, and mysterious blue eyes of a traditional Nordic beauty. Nevertheless, all the attention is focused on her amazing physique. Jill's mother owns enormous jugs. Jill's are somewhat, but not much, smaller. Jill has long, gorgeous legs and is otherwise athletic, slender, and supple. Sadly, Willie didn't win the gene lottery. Her shoulders are broad. Her legs, her peasant hips, and no waist would look better on a chicken. Her Dutch face is broad and her teeth are slightly gapped. When Willie and I first met, she was 18. At one place, I was a regular. The cuisine wasn't the reason I was there. The gorgeous blonde waitress who always appeared to be allocated to my table was the reason I was eating there. Asking her out didn't take many visits. After a few coffee dates, we went on an actual date. I still recall my initial impression of their filthy tiny apartment. The one-bedroom flat inhabited by the two women would induce claustrophobia in a coal miner. Willie opened the door. She was well known to me. However, it was my first encounter with her. This one is going to have a hard time finding a husband, was my first thinking. Then Jill showed up, and all thoughts of Willie's situation disappeared. All I had seen of Jill was a variation of her uniform as a waitress. She was now standing there, her sheaf of dazzling blonde hair dangling down to her shoulder blades, wearing an inexpensive little black dress. Every curve of her slender figure was embraced by the fabric. She probably only had one good dress. However, it showcased all of her best features, including her enormous, gorgeous physique and her stunningly long legs. While Willie looked at her sister with pure hero adoration, I just stood there, mouth agape. You like? Jill asked after spinning around a little. I exclaimed, genuinely shocked, you're beautiful. With a seductive smile, she remarked, I bet you say that to all the women you date. I said, I have never dated a woman as beautiful as you. She looked at her with that simpering face that women have when they are upset. It did, as she remarked, flattery might get you laid. It required multiple dates. Nevertheless, Jill finally consented to spend the weekend at a charming bed and breakfast near Marine City. At 19, Willie was fully capable of taking care of herself. Thus, the problem was in Jill's absence. All I could hope for was that Jill would be able to move past the constant thought of feeding and caring for her sister. Jill is a reserved, introspective person. She has a broad perspective on the world and can be deliciously witty. However, she is usually quiet and never lets her guard down. Her reserved demeanor made her seem like one of those responsible people. As the primary caregiver for a baby, I assume any six-year-old would have a few monkeys sleeping in their attic. However, Jill was completely insane in her need to make things right for Willie, especially when they were either beyond of her control or impossible to mend. We enjoyed a lovely meal at a beautiful restaurant with a river view. After that, we took a seat in our charming Victorian room. I tried to regain my breath as I rolled off of her, and things were that way. In terms of appearance or personality, I couldn't compare to Jill. She was an intelligent woman who created a bedroom experience every night. So it made sense that Jill and Willie would take up residence in my larger two-bedroom flat. Willie arrived carrying the parcel. I never considered the possibility that she wouldn't. After a year, we got married. The only bridesmaid was Willie. There was nothing much that could be done about Willie's face. However, her dress cut revealed a good half yard of cleavage, which made her beautiful enough to draw some interest from single guys. It was an interesting wedding. My family is hardly anything. When I was five years old, my parents got divorced, and my mother vanished into thin air. I therefore didn't even consider inviting her. My father was a good man. He tried his hardest juggling daycare and his career. He is medium in height and slightly too muscular, just like myself. We both lifted, and it was a connecting moment. However, he usually strikes me as the well-mannered neighbor you always contact when anything needs fixing. I never considered the possibility that he may be anything but dull. Jill's parents both turned up. By midday, her elderly father was inebriated and unconscious while the welcome was underway. 
Her mother was dressed, for once, like a regular woman rather than a stripper. It worried me that she seemed to fall hard for my old dad right away. For most of the day, my dad was unaware that he was being picked on, even though Jill's mother took advantage of every chance to get back at him. When she bent down to whisper something in his ear at dinner, he finally understood. It took me no time at all to figure out what that was. He blinked awake, and I was afraid he would burst into flames. Rather, though, he stood up with dignity and held out his hand. With a nonchalant expression, Jill's mother and she left the stage simultaneously. Perhaps I underestimated the old guy, I thought to myself. Another strange thing was that Willie started dating. Although Willie isn't a prize, neither was this guy. I am hesitant to refer to him as Quasimodo because he was not hunchback. Still, he was roughly 5'3". All night long, they danced together. Willie is more like 57. That's why Quasi seemed to be enjoying himself greatly while burying his nose in her cleavage for the entirety of that period. The man worked for Jill's mother. I was unaware of their partnership. However, Jill's mother demanded that he be invited. He was evidently her biggest admirer, and she wanted to return the favor. I really hoped it had nothing to do with the fact that they were sharing a bed. My stomach turned to vomit at the thought of Jill's mother being ridden by that little spider monkey. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment at the time. We slept in the bedroom with the in-suit, while Willie slept in the smaller one. It had been 14 months since Jill and I moved in together. Our wedding night therefore felt a lot like any other night. Both of us felt a little tipsy. However, we anticipated celebrating upon returning home. I picked up the new Mrs. Flaherty and carried her across the threshold, and that was the only difference between that night and all the others. Then I nearly let her go. That's because sounds of a woman being royally slept together assailed our ears. Willie seemed to have discovered a man. I spent the better part of the night listening to Jill and me make out. It didn't really matter that it was also our wedding night because we had been incredibly close for much longer than a year. Still, I was amazed with the gargoyle's endurance. While Jill and I were enjoying breakfast, the two of them came out. I had a chance to get a better look at the guy. The two were meant to be together. He lacked Willie's attractiveness. She was giving the guy a rock star-like look. However, I could tell my new wife's disgust was written all over her face. I had to give Jill my consent. The man had close-set eyes, filthy black hair that was slicked back, small feral eyes, acne, and one of those pig snouts that made him look nearly childish and nasty as sin. However, his demeanor suggested that he felt unappealing. Rather than focus on the woman who had spent the entire evening giving him pleasure, it was the crudest and most tone-deaf thing I had ever seen. He approached Jill, put a proprietary hand on her shoulder, and said, Hey babe, I'm Ralph. Do you want a sample of the thing I gave your sister? I'm always ready. Jill appeared astonished. The guy had just embarrassed her sister in addition to showing her contempt. Get your hand off me, or I'm going to cut it off with this bread knife. She yelled, brandishing the knife menacingly. And don't ever think about touching me again, creep. She continued. She must have believed that Ralph was her only chance, as Willie reassured her, he was just teasing sis. Ralph has a great sense of humor. I said menacingly, a foot taller and approximately 120 pounds heavier, I don't think he's funny. To make my point more clearly, I walked around the table to stand next to the little garbage. He was not impressed. He did not apologize, instead, he smirked and said, you don't know what you're missing baby. He then scampered over to the seat that I had just cleared. I was going to eat breakfast when he started to consume it. Jill and I looked at each other in disbelief. Don't kill him, he's Willie's boyfriend, she muttered to herself. If only Ralph had not been such a bothersome little person, it may have been genuinely romantic. It had happened that two of the ugliest people on the planet had met. However, Ralphie's mindset was more along the lines of believing that by moving in with Willie, he was doing him a huge service. Yes, I said, moving in. Because the annoying little prick never went away. He used to spend the entire day at the apartment sipping my beer and eating my meals. Then he would beat Jill's sister till dawn, keeping us up all night. He did not hold a job. He said that his superiors were unable to take criticism. I was at my breaking point. I made an attempt to eject the small man. However, Jill came to me when Willie made an appeal to her. I informed her that if I had to live with Ralph for one more month, Ralph was going to die. She answered, Willie loves him. She says she'll die without him. Jill was persistent. She obsessively guarded her sister. Thus, we moved out in its place. We purchased a home. The tiny home was tidy. We could have afforded more, and I was earning a respectable salary. However, I was still required to pay the apartment's rent. It appears that Willie and Ralph were unable to manage the elevator. Willie worked, at least. Cleaning houses was a minimum pay job. Her meager amount could hardly provide for them. For as long as he could, Ralph was going to survive on her. I persevered because I loved Jill. Naturally, Jill was thrilled to hear that Willie was content. And if Jill was happy, I was consistently happy, over and over. We ultimately chose a one-story craftsman-style home with an open floor plan that included the kitchen, dining area, and living room. Across the home from the kitchen, on the other side, was a little hallway that led to the two bedrooms and the bathroom. It was a pleasant place to raise children, who arrived sooner rather than later, and it was cozy and compact. Jill revealed her pregnancy two months before we moved into our new apartment. 
Little Billy was a delight to have around. When he had colic, I did everything, from diaper patrol to staying up all night. Jill would do nothing but raise Billy, we both decided. She was an insane workout enthusiast as well. She desired to regain her pre-pregnancy figure. That activity gave me a hard body and an even bigger body. After a few months of enjoying Jill's bounty, she revealed that she was expecting again. Jill resumed taking the pill permanently, and I thought, you're a fertile little princess aren't you? It was enough to have two children. Luckily, the second one proved to be a girl in my life's passion, possibly except for her mother. Fathers always find great pleasure in their little girls, and Jody was no exception. Life continued, and our family was happy. I was really proud of Jill since she was an amazing mother. As it happened, Willie was an even greater aunt. It turned into an issue very soon. During the time we were raising our children, Willie and Ralphie were married. Ralph got his shit on and hit on all the bridesmaids, including Jill, as payback for us paying for the wedding. We had a conversation in the parking lot after I let his inebriated ass out. I told him to get over it and show Willie some dignity. Alternatively, I planned to beat his ass. He gave me the macho look, bristling, and said he would like to see me give it a go. I grabbed him by both shoulders and held him away from me to prevent him from kicking me. I know you act like a jerk to get attention, but you are part of this family now, and I'm going to kick your butt if you embarrass us, got it? I shouted, shaking him like I was trying to get cat poop off a rug. He acknowledged me with a little nod of his head. I was aware that would kill him. A little while later, we discovered him unconscious in the back seat of our car. I lay him down and whispered, remember what I just said. Following our brief conversation, I heard no more terrifying tales about Ralphie. Willie's disposition may best be described as sorrowful and pitiful, as we spent more time with her than she did at her residence. I thought Ralph was playing around with her. He had been making side requests for money ever since. At last, I asked Jill what the issue was. I was just waiting for an excuse to give him the finger. Willie wanted a child, she said. But no matter how often she and Ralphie slept, none was to come. So I replied, have they been to a doctor? They can check on that stuff, even provide fertility drugs. Jill responded, neither of them are working right now. They can't afford that kind of thing. I was considering the dubious morality of having a child that you couldn't afford to raise. However, I foolishly declared, I'll pay for it. The tests were completed, and the outcomes were received. The news could not have been worse. Willie couldn't conceive, among her other shortcomings. She found that to be upsetting. Her entire identity and life's work revolved around having and raising children. However, Ralphie was just as powerful as Donkey from Shrek, the gods adore irony. Ralphie, of course, seized every chance to point out Willie's shortcomings, which resulted in yet another heart-to-heart. -heart. I informed him that I wanted to hear nothing more about Willie. I replied, she's your wife for God's sake. Show some respect. I was at a loss for words when he simply scoffed at me and said, she's not much of a wife if she can't give me kids. It was so wrong in so many ways. There was nothing to be done but wring his neck or turn away. I turned, walked out to my truck, and made my way home. I detested the man. Obviously, nothing changed after my talk with the tiny garbage, because Willie's sadness only deepened. Jill was worried beyond belief that she was losing weight. We recommended adoption. Willie would have tried. The gargoyle vetoed that, though. He claimed he wanted his own children, not those of another. All Willie wanted was to be loved. It was becoming quite painful. Furthermore, Jill was falling into Willie's depressing spiral since she was experiencing this strange mother-sister dynamic. It was impacting not just our children but also me. Jody was about five years old, and Billy was six. They knew, therefore, that negative energy was there in the house. They asked me what was wrong over and over. Still, I was completely taken aback by what transpired next. After work, I was unwinding on the sofa. Jill took a seat next to me. When I wrapped my arm around her, she curled up under it. Jill is a direct, matter-of-fact, and serious individual. She made a frown and said, we've done nothing but talk about her problem. Willie and I have talked about her problem, she replied. I said, the situation's hopeless. The doctors were firm. She can't conceive and her husband won't consider adoption. He wants his own spawn walking the earth, God help us all. So, it's the classic catch-22. How can a husband have a child if he won't adopt, and the wife can't conceive? Something said, timidly, from under my arm, he could have won through a surrogate. I chuckled and replied, that's a minimum of 20,000. Those guys can't even afford to pay their own rent and there is no way I'd loan it to them, even if I had it, which I don't. Tensely, Jill remarked, they wouldn't need one if I bore the child for them. You know how fertile I am. There was no progress being made in this conversation. Breezily, I replied, but we can't afford the treatment to get you pregnant either. Who says we would need a treatment? She asked, her voice suddenly choked with nervousness. It was as sudden as a thunderclap. In order to give her despondent younger sister the baby she so much wanted, my wife was suggesting that she let the annoying little lizard to sleep with her. Though I should have been furious, the concept was so absurd that I started giggling. I replied, you mean to tell me that you're willing to let that creepy little weasel make you pregnant? That's the worst idea I've ever heard. On the couch, she spun around so that her back was to me. I was to glimpse her eyes, she wished. They were determined and stern. 
She stated, Willie is going to die if she doesn't have a child to raise. She doesn't eat. She doesn't sleep. She stopped work and she just lies around the house crying. So, if I have to let that loathsome little troll put his man juice in me, I'll do it. I'd do anything to save my sister. Now I was starting to feel hot. I replied, would that include getting divorced? Because I am simply not going to let my wife screw another man. And I am definitely not going to let her bear another man's child. Particularly a guy as contemptible as Ralphie Baby. Jill started crying. With tears streaming down her face, she cried, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is killing Willie. She turned to face me, we have to do something. I can't just let her die. My rage was growing by the moment. I replied, look at this from my point of view. No man would allow his wife to sleep another man with his consent. I know that Willie is a professional victim and I know that you feel like you always have to ride to her rescue. But, this is too much to ask. I have a few rights too. Jill's whole attitude shifted. She replied, what's the problem? There's nothing between Ralph and me. In fact, I find him repulsive. But, my eggs are the closest you can get to Willie's. So, it would be like she had her own child. This would just be a biological function. It wouldn't change anything between you and me. I understood it. Jill was attempting to convince me of her viewpoint. Wishing you luck on that one. I replied, I know that the whole thing would be clinical, not emotional. But Ralphie baby would have to put it in you and fire it off to make that baby. Then of course, there's the matter of you carrying his child for nine months. Those two things are the part that I can't accept. It's an atavistic thing. Guys are wired to ensure the survival of their own genes. Jill responded, but we have. You have two beautiful children and we agreed to stop there. I don't look forward to waddling around here for nine months with somebody else's kid. But surrogacy is socially accepted now, in a voice that was still reasonable. I know because I looked it up on the internet that there have been almost 40,000 babies born that way. She continued with a little girl's sincerity. Well, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Jill continued, begging, people won't stone me in the streets for being a surrogate, especially if we make it clear that it's to save Willie's life. She then teasingly said, and remember how needy I get when I'm pregnant. I replied, I love you Jill and I want you to be happy, I even want Willie to be happy. But, this is too much to ask. You can't protect Willie forever. She's a grown woman. And Willie is just going to have to accept that you sometimes can't get what you want. That's where we left it. I had the impression that Jill and Willie thought of me as a hybrid of Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch. However, I didn't give a damn. Eventually, Willie was as normal as she could be and Jill went back to being Jill. Well, I was mistaken about it. At work, I received a frantic call. It came from Jill. I heard her sobbing clumsily, but I managed to decipher her words. Willie, X myself, hospital. Hurrying to St. Joe's, I made my way up to Willie's room. The pitiful scene that met my eyes had all the Victorian melodrama of a soap opera. Sleeping soundly in a bed was Willie. With her heart breaking, Jill was crying uncontrollably while lying on the bed, clutching Willie's hand. Even their mother was present, her face streaming with copious amounts of mascara. The two women pivoted and glared at me. I should not have been surprised to learn that Willie viewed my refusal to allow Jill to sell herself as a totally unreasonable and selfish act on my behalf. She therefore made the decision to end her own life as she had no chance of obtaining her greatest wish. She took over the counter sleeping medications, fortunately. After locating her, Jill dialed 911. After pumping Willie's stomach, they planned to let her go the following day. Of course, that started off the conversation all over again. I wasn't going to listen to a woman who probably did the one simple thing three times a night in the back seat of customers' cars. Jill's mother angrily shouted, look what you've done. All you had to do was to let Jill do one simple thing and this never would have happened. Still, I was starting to give up. Suddenly, allowing Jill to become pregnant with Ralphie Boy seemed insignificant in comparison to Willie taking her own life. I went to face my wife and asked, are you willing to risk our marriage because I'm not sure I can handle this? Jill continued to be a whiner. I thought to myself, how the hell would you know? But she leaped to her feet and exclaimed, God yes, I love you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Her mother gave her an encouraging you're doing the right thing. And so it happened that, three months later, Jill and I were seated uneasily in our living room. We arranged the donation to coincide with her most fertile cycle after she had gone off the pill for two cycles. The arrangement was as methodical as it appeared. Jill has been incredibly loving ever since we made the decision to move forward. She seemed to be attempting to convey to me how much my sacrifice meant to her. That, of course, excluded my actually touching her. All eyes were on Ralphie, not mine, to make sure the baby was his. Our forced celibacy cast a long shadow over moral questions. Typically, we shared a bed three or four times a week. Thus, the abstinence time was agonizing. My perpetual lust made my sacrifice seem much more immediate and real. Jill also confided in me that she was dying from the layoff. Of course, I was doing it for Jill, but as she stated, she was doing this for Willie. My wife, dressed in nothing but a robe, was looking forward to what was coming next. Her gorgeous, long, naked legs were a sight to behold. Her large frame created a flawless cleavage in the robe's neck. 
Her mother was watching the kids at her house, behaving like a nana for once. Ralphie simply walked in at the scheduled time. He was utterly self-satisfied. With a timid and nervous expression, Willie lagged after, saying to Jill, Okay, baby, you're about to get the time of your life. Ralphie rubbed his hands together. I replied, Sit down. We need to get some rules first. She's going to love it. Who needs rules? He replied, glancing at me. I intended to murder the small weasel. Willie went from being joyful to being distraught in the space of a microsecond when I turned to Jill and said menacingly, This isn't going to work. Jill realized that she needed to take action or the sale would fall through. We are going to do this once, she declared, her voice steely. Ralphie just wanted to get to it, and I could see that none of that registered on him. That's when Jill took hold of Ralphie's hand and pulled him away toward our bedroom, her long blonde hair swinging in the breeze, her gorgeous round butt twitching, and it was evident that under that silk robe was nothing as Jill. The discomfort of the thing hit me like a freight train, and I was reminded of how beautiful and sensual she was, and also of what I'd consented to. I now saw the implied folly of the old saying, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Jill was doing this for her sister, whom she loved so passionately that she couldn't see what she was doing to me, but I was a tough guy and I could take the hit for my wife's sake, so it was also acceptable, at least in theory. There were none of the problems connected with cheating, because I was dead certain that she was doing this out of a core love and giving nature, not out of a desire to be deposited by that tiny freak. The gremlin was 5 foot 3 and maybe 115 pounds, whereas I am 6 2 and 240 pounds. The problem was that Jill had to be as intimate as a woman can get with a man, and then she was going to bear his child. That broke every marriage precept, no matter how justified the reason. Jill didn't love the man, in fact, she hated him. He wasn't going to take her away from me. I knew Jill was right. I just didn't realize how upsetting the real process would be. It was like I'd fallen into a bad dream. Meanwhile, Willie had wandered off to the kitchen to make herself a cup of coffee. This didn't seem like a big deal to her because she was getting what she wanted. I sat uneasily as Willie looked casually through a magazine, knowing that they would be out of there in a few minutes. Suddenly, I heard a knee hit the wall. She was dressing her small husband, and I responded, I hope you're satisfied. Yes, I'm going to have my baby, she smirked. It was worthwhile. That's not what I meant, I remarked. You've just destroyed your sister's union. Her expression was horrified, and I shut the door. Jill was lying exactly where I had left her when I went into the bedroom and sat at the side of the bed. Some men might try to reclaim their territory at this point, but I wasn't one of those men. Rather than turning me on, the dirty show she'd just put on had made me question whether I wanted to stay married to her. As I sat gently next to her, she stirred, completely languid from the afterglow, but then recognition hit and her eyes flew open in horror. Her mouth dropped open in terror as I could see her mentally reliving the entire experience. Her lips was heavily smeared from their passionate kiss, so it was understandable that she would be afraid. That sight was almost more terrifying than the connection. I knew I had to maintain composure or something unforgivable would happen, so even though I was furiously angry, I was still processing everything and added, emotionlessly, I'll see you in the kitchen, and for God's sake take a shower. Since I don't drink in the afternoons, I poured myself a couple of fingers of Glenlivet and took a huge gulp, feeling the fiery liquor burn all the way down till it touched the bottom, which jolted my head and made me hear the start of the shower. I looked over what I knew, in hindsight, having a sexual relationship with another man, even for purely altruistic reasons, was a foolish and fundamentally unethical conduct, but we had both agreed to allow her to do it, even though her crazy sister had to use drastic measures to persuade us. It was the strange codependent relationship that Jill had with Willie that was the root cause of this, of course, I knew my wife wasn't quite right going into the relationship, and I accepted it. I even admired her for her unwavering loyalty to her sister. Of course, Jill had no obligation to fix things for Willie. Her sister was an adult. Bad things happen in adults cope. It wasn't that Ralphie was a stud. Jill's becoming insane was completely unexpected. Therefore, I was wondering what Jill's excuse was for being so completely feral, and it had better be a good one. I blamed her, and her alone, for that. However, at the same time, something had to be done about Ralphie boy. Ralphie had lived a life on the edge, relying on his small stature to shield him from people such as myself. However, we all agreed that the goal was impregnation, not pleasure, and that awful Jill had made it personal between us. He was going to get his. Aside from that, I was also resolved about another issue. All of them had better hope that the first treatment worked, because this was going to be the only time Ralphie boy would touch Jill under my supervision. I'm not sure what I was thinking when I agreed to let Jill screw him in the first place. I guess I really wasn't thinking. Naturally, I couldn't fathom how I would cope with Jill carrying a child inside of her, particularly one that had been fathered by that cunning little varmint. That's presuming I could even continue being married to her. We'd had a great happy marriage up until this point, 
and the kids were the joy of my life, but I wasn't sure I would ever be able to touch Jill again because of the image of Ralphie Boy's man juices all over her thighs and lower tummy. Even so, when the time came, I would have to cross that bridge because the subject of my ruminations had materialized in the doorway. She was dressed in a basic white t-shirt and jeans. Her gorgeous wheaten hair pulled back and secured in a ponytail. She had no makeup on, and she was still possibly the most beautiful thing I had ever laid eyes on. I laughed, even though I knew it was a serious issue, as she cautiously rounded the corner as if I was about to kill her. I pointed to the other chair and said, relax, the SIG's still locked in the gun safe. She walked over without a word and plopped down, head hanging. Then, with tears in her eyes, she looked up at me and sobbed, I'm sorry, I apologize so much, please pardon me, don't leave me, please. Honestly, there is no way I am going to be able to unhear what I just heard, I remarked, giving her an honest look. And that has completely altered the dynamics in our marriage, Jill said with disgust. I still love you, I said. Still, that is unimportant. Before deciding what to do about this, I need to comprehend what transpired. That was just incredible of you to do that. I said matter-of-factly, attempting to hide my displeasure, it was embarrassing. You were completely out of control when you were with him. What took place? Why did you behave in such a filthy manner? Well, that last comment was comforting, but it wasn't helpful if we were trying to find a solution. Jill gradually regained control and lifted her face, smeared with tears, to face me. I don't know what happened, she muttered, dropping her head onto the table and starting to cry onto her arms. I just sat there, staring at her coldly. Since we quit sharing a bed, I've become really needy, especially in the last several days. That certainly helped, I know. However, my lack of preparation was the primary issue. She went on, for the past week, I had been trying to psych myself out to respond a little bit. I looked confused, merely to motivate him to move quickly. She continued, I expected it to be a quick and out. I would spread my legs and he would pump for a couple of minutes until he came. I was afraid that he'd hurt me if I was dry. So, I put in some of that lubricating gel. It makes things tingly down there. That contributed to the problem. With an embarrassed expression on her face, she added, He attacked me the moment we closed the door. He ripped off my robe and pushed me on the bed. Then he jumped on me. Somehow, he was already bare. It seemed as though his clothes blew off him as he made his way to the bed, I snorted. She looked ashamed and replied, He just shoved it in and started frantically humping me. I was telling him to slow down. But, he was a man possessed. I have never had a man slept me like that and it wasn't enjoyable, at first. With a deeply embarrassed expression, she continued, but he was like the Energizer Bunny. He kept pounding me at an irresistible rate, and he was hitting all my sensitive parts. She murmured, eventually it started feeling very good. I tried to fight it, but a woman is helpless, once she gets in that position. I was flat on my back with him buried as deep as he could inside me and there was no stopping him. Her voice had the tone of someone explaining an aircraft crash. He kept pounding me and I finally lost control. There were a couple of seconds of panic and then the first good time hit. After that, it was one good time after another. That's where all concept of right and wrong flew out the window, and I just wrapped my legs around him and rode the wave. She looked me in the eyes and said, I haven't come in almost a month and the good time he was giving me were so irresistibly delicious. By that point, I had no idea where I was or who was screwing me. I know what I did was unforgivable, but it was nothing I expected or wanted to do. The combination of the long layoff and the rate he was humping me just totally overwhelmed me. She appeared to be weeping when she stated, I don't know what part of Nirvana I was in when he finally came, but it was a long way from sanity. Then, before I knew it he'd stuck it back in and we were off to the races again. I have no idea how he could do that. Without much emotion, I remarked, your sister said that the little rodent took a couple of Viagras. She looked disdainful and replied, that explains it. I was already so turned on that his sliding up into me simply blew my mind. I've got no idea what I did after that. But, I do know I was totally out of control. Then he finally came in me again. At that point, I was so physically drained that I was almost comatose. The next thing I knew you were sitting there. She was distraught and continued, I know it must have been horrible. It would have killed me to overhear that. What did you do to Ralph? He wasn't there when I came to. I hope the police aren't involved. I quipped, I tossed him out on the front lawn. Last time I saw him your sister was dressing him. I told him I'd kill him if I ever saw him again. I glanced at her to see how she would respond. It could have been a constructive thing, in a weird codependent way. But he chose to make it personal, I said venomously. I mean it. A guy with so little honor needs to be put down. He broke every rule in the man code. Jill smiled grimly but approvedly. I continued, I blame you and me. We shouldn't have let it happen in the first place. But screwing you like that was a totally self-centered and contemptible act. And Ralphie baby owes me a serious debt, glancing at her so she could see how angry I was. Timorously replied Jill, so, where do we go from here? I can't tell you how sorry I am. It seemed like such a simple thing. Now it's threatening our marriage. I replied, well, I know for sure that I still love you, but it will take some time before I can get over what just happened. Jill appeared stunned. She responded, what does that mean? What are you planning to do? 
I smiled at her and said, I'm not planning on doing anything different. We agreed to stay celibate until we knew for sure that you were pregnant. That's going to be easy since, the one thing that I can assure you is that I will have a hard time touching you with the ghost of Ralphie boy haunting our bedroom. After that, who knows? I guess we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Does that mean you won't make love to me after they confirm the pregnancy? She added, looking upset and crying. I gave her a disbelieving look. It seems that she didn't fully understand the circumstances. It had nothing to do with her sleeping with Ralphie boy. She went into that bedroom, and I understood why. Even with how completely flawed the reasoning was, in hindsight I still thought she had good intentions. It wasn't even that she lost her mind over the insignificant things. I could understand that was the outcome of Ralphie Boy's deceit, and I felt genuine sympathy. With a cold stare, I stated to her, First of all, we don't know if you are indeed pregnant. Ralphie Boy has already had his chance if you're not. Additionally, you will need to do it after we've signed the paperwork if you wish to do it with him once more. It appeared as though she would argue. Then rationality might start to take hold. She paused, thought about what she was going to say, and decided. She added, I was thinking about that myself, as her expression stiffened. I want him to never, ever touch me again. That was the only response that would allow the conversation to continue, good girl. With all my heart, I said, this was a morally reprehensible idea from the start, and there won't be a day too, if you wish to remain married to me, anyway. Situation is first. However, twice would constitute hostile behavior. And from what I saw, you've got enough of his seed in you to spawn a baseball team, I said, looking horrified. Jill appeared embarrassed. She did, however, go on, I put on a little pad to hold it all in. That was much too much data. She trembled when I shot her an irate glance. So assuming you got what you and Willie want, I said to him, we now have to cope with morning sickness, back pain, swollen feet, and all those doctor appointments along with the joys of pregnancy. That's going to pull me screaming and kicking into the situation, I said with a scowl. The issue was that we had both failed to consider the big picture. Now it was summertime. I suppose Ralphie's evil sperm would give birth to the Antichrist, and Jill would give birth to him in the early spring. That meant she would be waddling through the winter and showing during the holidays. The future really depends on a few things, I remarked. Firstly, I want you to know that you are married to me and not your sister. I am aware of your strong bonds with her and I appreciate your dedication to her. However, she must not be included in our marriage going forward. You owe it to the kids and myself, not to her. Fearfully, Jill asked, what are you trying to say? Ah, Willie remained the same, so I sent her a cold stare and told her, it's me and the kids first now, and Willie comes second. First, I'm going to kick them off the gravy train, I said emphatically. I will no longer serve as their personal bank account. This implies that Ralphie needs to get employment in order for them to have a place to live. God, they are both grown-ups. With hesitation, Jill stated, I don't think Ralph can support them. Then Willie is very welcome to move in with us, I answered. Even the carefree attitude she adopted is forgiven, since you and Ralphie boy were tearing up the bed linens. However, I hope to never see Ralph again. Because if I do, the only thing left to decide is where to bury the body, Jill thought for a brief while. I know that Willie will end up with us because Ralph will never be anything but an immature little creep, she continued, her voice full of determination. It's the correct thing to do, even though Willie might detest it and possibly blame me. There were several adjustments during the next few weeks. A few days later, Jill told two of them the news. Ralphie showed up at my place as planned, determined to straighten me out about a few things. I was going to pay that visit. I took him by the back of his neck as soon as he entered the home and hauled him to the restroom. I had drawn him a big, long bathtub earlier. I dove his head under the water while he was screaming profanities. I kept him there till his struggle came to an end. He was a douchebag, so I added a count of 15 after that. When I pulled him out, he wasn't conscious. I repeatedly smacked his face till he became conscious and I pushed him back under the water. He started making I surrender motions almost instantly. I submerged him until I was positive he believed he was going to die. I pulled him out into the living room and dumped him onto the couch as he was gasping. He resembled a drowned rat exactly. I responded, you should be killed for what you did to my wife. Most people would. I am, nevertheless, a compassionate and loving person, as you can see. Thus, I promise not to kill you unless I see you again. Nobody's going to protect you, I said brusquely, not Jill, not Willie, and definitely not the authorities. You'll note there's no sign of what just transpired, I'm simply too smart for that. You won't care about it anyhow, of course, as you'll be dead. You'd never do that. He exclaimed, with everything I had to detest, I said, try me. I must have shown it to him, since Ralphie boy understood the message. Like a small rodent facing a very enormous cat, I could smell the terror. You and Willie are on your own, I continued. We will treat the unborn child as if it were our own if Jill is indeed pregnant. You have now and forever removed yourself from the picture. He began to protest. I walked confidently through the room, silently took hold of his neck, and turned to head back toward the restroom. Okay, I get it, he exclaimed, clearly upset. I spun around, hauled him to the door, and threw him onto the same patch of grass as before. On the sidewalk stood Jill and Willie. Clearly, they had been waiting to find out what would happen. 
Ralphie was run by Willie. Jill approached me with a very arrogant and smug demeanor and gave me a shoulder punch. Nice arm, she said. I wrapped the questioned arm over her and pulled her in. It was going to be challenging. However, things would turn out okay. Conclusion. Within the next month, two issues were corrected on their own. Ralphie Boy first performed a complete disappearance act. That occurred a few weeks following our previous Heart to Heart. I felt let down. I hoped that he would turn around once more. Because I was thinking about Ralphie and this terrible wood chipper disaster. Rather, one day Willie found the small reptile had done a runner when he got home from work. It seems that Ralphie has finally realized that the gravy train has permanently derailed. He simply scuttled off to pastures that were greener. The only thing I regretted was not knowing what became of him. I hoped somewhere he was living in a cardboard box. However, men such as Ralphie are like to the commonplace cockroach. They always make it out of any difficult scenario. When the major news that Jill was definitely pregnant came in, Willie was crushed. That completely destroyed any memories she had of Ralphie boy. Even still, we had to keep the kids and all of our acquaintances informed about Jill's growing belly, which tempered the delirious excitement shared by the two ladies. In an indirect way, we told our pals that Jill was surrogating, which was exactly true. Words like disgusted and judgmental usually sum up how everyone reacted to that news. We told a modified version of that to the children. We claimed that because their mother was such a wonderful mother, we had placed their cousin within her womb. They both accepted that explanation. Yes, Jill is an excellent mother. Jody felt ecstatic. Billy was old enough to not give a damn about female technology. With our present one, I received a good offer, so I was no longer floating Ralphie Boy's way of life. We thus moved into a larger, newer house right away. After the basement was built, Willie moved in. It was as though she had her own space because it had an outside entrance. That was really handy as the deadline approached. The delivery went as usual, a 20-hour agony. Jill's Lamaze coach the entire time was Willie. I found it difficult to participate. Make fun of me if you want. But I had to get my message across. All Jill wanted was for someone to nod her tubes, which she said while she lay there afterwards. It was a small girl baby. Thankfully, she looked more like Jill than Pig Face. Willie was overjoyed. She took over the child's care right away. It should come as no surprise that she made a fantastic mother right away. She seems to have only ever wanted this baby in her life. Her pure love for a child who wasn't actually hers, in my opinion, made up for part of the pain she'd caused me when I received it. The other two women in our home provided Willie with a great deal of support. Of course, Jill had to conduct the feeding. However, Jody, who was six years old, was attempting to pass for Julie's mother. Perhaps the gene for irresistible motherhood ran in the family. You still have one more crucial question, I know. Yes, is the response. We eventually regained our marital enchantment. However, it wasn't simple. We had a pregnancy-related justification for not having sex. Unfortunately, though, nothing remained when the all-clear signal was given. Jill continued to make noise. Thus, even though the apparatus continued to function, my heart wasn't in it. It hurt Jill that she could tell. We would frequently just end a performance in the middle. Exasperated, I would turn over and attempt to fall asleep. All night long, Jill would wail. However, we persisted. Really, which option did we have? We were in love with one another. The fact that alcohol is quicker led to the breakthrough. We happened to be at a block party. Willie was observing every child. A huge delight for Billy and Jody was spending the night in their own basement because they were quite fond of tiny Julie. After a little drink, we drove home without experiencing any pain. Jill giggled as she undressed, and I slid beneath the covers next to her. It was difficult for me to stay in her, much less finish the act. However, I hadn't visited in about a year. Thus, the urge was present, to put it mildly. I put a lot of effort into getting where I needed to be. She was sinking her heels into my back in a rhythmic manner while wrapping her legs around me and pushing me to do the same. Give it all to me. After that, we lay in a drenched pile. I was completely sober from the exertion. We were both prepared to talk about this. My wife finally turned to face me and hesitantly whispered, Welcome back. You know what, I said. I believe that I am back. I hope that works out well. Well then, let's find out, exclaimed Jill. And we did, that evening and for the remainder of our lives after that, multiple times. My comment, disgusting story, what kind of wimp lets the slimy guy sleep his wife then lets him go without some really serious happen to him? Comment down below.